Good morning, Bethlehem Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us on this Sunday, September 19th. I hope you are well. Hope you've had a good week and maybe had some times alone with God in prayer or in Scripture. Maybe you've even had a chance to help somebody this week. Show the love of Christ, maybe even share a bit of your faith with somebody. Um, that's wonderful. God always gives us different opportunities every week to do good things uh, for him. And so I, I hope uh, it's been a good week for you. These things I've got up on the pulpit today are to remind us that we're in a month here where we're making donations to the community closet. The program we do to give out clothing uh, to, to many different families within our community and district. And so we've been collecting, you know, coats and clothes for a long time. But we're now collecting uh, a new uh, socks and underwear and laundry detergent. And so if you go to Walmart and you're buying things for yourself, if you wanted to pick up some socks, some underwear, and some laundry detergent, that would be great. In October, we're going to be giving out the clothes uh, to the families, and so we want to have some of that in there for them as well. And you can drop those off at the church at any time, and we will get it to them starting next month. Also just wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that our women's retreat is coming up in two weeks. It's October 1st through the 3rd. And you can uh, go for just the day, just the Saturday if you'd like, or you can go for the whole weekend. Um, but we need to know right away if you're interested in going. It'll be at Covenant Cedars, and it should be a great time of rest and renewal. I think there's about 15 people in the church going. If you'd be interested in going too, let me know right away. Um, but we have a college student every week that we pray for and that we put the address of their college and their dorm there in uh, our church email. This week, it is Maya Qualset at Nebraska Wesleyan. So keep her in your prayers and uh, send her a little note, maybe, if you want to, uh, this week and encourage her as she's a freshman at Nebraska Wesleyan. Um, another, just a couple announcements coming up in October. On October 8th, we have a breakout, grade 6 through 8, all-nighter. They're going to be doing some fun things throughout the, throughout the night, going to a hockey game, going out miniature golfing, going to have Bible study under the stars, uh, watch movie, whatever, just a lock-in, you know, kind of a thing, but out and about doing things. And so that's coming up. Make sure you pass the word and get signed up for that with Pastor Carter. Um, but then also on the 15th, the week after, is the high school one. So October 15th, we have Collide, and that's grades 9 through 12. And we have the all-nighter for them, and it'll be similar. So tell your kids about that. Pass that on to their friends as well. And then the final announcement that I have for us today is that on October 24th, uh, we're going to have our trunk or treat and our... Um, fall festival. We're going to have it at the Cove in town again. We're going to have a whole bunch of cars set up, and trunks where you can bring the kids by and, and uh, get the candy. Maybe you even want to volunteer a trunk and fill up your, you know, the back of your trunk with some kind of like little theme or something and then hand out candy to the kids as they come by. Um, we're also going to have uh, like a coffee truck that's going to be there and some pumpkin stuff and some other fun things for family uh, to do at this. And so it's a great outreach and a great opportunity uh, to uh, be together. So that's coming up October 24th, which is a Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. So just kind of mark that on your calendars uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be there before you know it. All right. And so if you have your Bibles now, we're going to get right into the sermon, and uh, we're going to be looking in the book of Exodus, if you want to turn over there. We're doing an overview of the Old Testament in 15 weeks. That's the series I'm on. This will take us all the way up uh, to Thanksgiving. And the first half of the Bible and the powerful stories of God's faithfulness and so much to learn, the foundations of our faith, we need to know this stuff. So 15 weeks we've been going through, or we are in the middle of now, uh, going through of the Old Testament. Today we move from the book of Genesis to the book of Exodus. And I want to begin to look at the story of Moses and how God would use this man to save his people and deliver his people out of slavery. It's an incredible story and so important to the rest of the Bible. And so we're looking at that. And 
the first question that we may have when we begin to approach that is, well, how did God's people even end up in slavery? I mean, last week we learned about Joseph and how he's second in command and he's in charge of all the food and, and he's saved all of Egypt, you know, during a famine. Well, how do we go from there to God's people becoming slaves? Well, we read about it in Exodus 1.7 where it says that after Joseph and that generation died, the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied and became exceedingly numerous, so Egypt was filled with them. And about a hundred or so years later, a new king of Egypt came into power, and he knew nothing about Joseph and all of that. And so in Exodus 1.9, it says, He said to the Egyptian people, Look, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they will turn on us and fight with our enemies. What is so interesting here is that Hitler said almost the same thing about the Jews in Germany. He spoke to his people, and got them to fear the Jews, resent them, accuse them, and rally the German people to oppress them. It's a story that repeats itself too often. And it has been their story from the beginning. Egypt deals with them by putting slave masters over them to try to control them and oppress them with harsh labor. But as we read through Exodus 1, it doesn't work. It says in Exodus 1.12, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. It's like the story of Joseph. Wherever evil tried to harm him, God's favor was upon him and protected him and grew him. Because his covenant was with him. His promise to Abraham. And so this is what was happening during this time too. And it made the Egyptians come to dread the Israelites more and work them more bitterly, make them make the bricks and build their buildings and even put laws into place that would try to keep these people from thriving. It was oppression in every sense of the word. And the king even told the midwives that whenever a Hebrew baby boy is born, I want you to kill it. But God again protected his people. For the midwives were Hebrew. And they feared God more than Pharaoh. And so they didn't obey his law. And the people kept increasing. Until by the time we get to Moses, there are two million Jews living in Egypt. We know this because later on in the book of Exodus, it says 600,000 men in Egypt left you know, with him to go out into the wilderness and cross the Red Sea and so forth. And so if you add in women and children to that number, we could estimate it about 2 million in the land at that time. Well, this makes Pharaoh so mad that the Hebrew midwives are not obeying his orders that he takes matters into his own hands and he orders his soldiers to go and kill every baby Hebrew boy the moment that they are born and to throw them into the Nile River. He was trying to destroy a people that he feared. And this is the horrible reality that God's people find themselves in at the start of the book of Exodus. It is sadly a horror we have seen play out many different times in history, in many different nations. Oppression. You know, one group making others slaves, one group trying to kill off the other, one group out of fear holding somebody back. This is the cry of the Israelites as they go to God every day in prayer at the start of the book of Exodus. Their backs are breaking under oppression. Their will is being crushed. Their children are being literally killed. God, we need you. I was thinking that probably around the world today, in places that we don't even hear about on the news, this is still happening. Different people groups are praying, like the Israelites maybe were back then. Maybe going through similar oppression, and we just don't even always know about it. 
Well, God's people have often had to face persecution and oppression in this life. Throughout the Old Testament, we read not just about Egypt, we read about others, other nations that enslaved God's people. We read about the Midianites or the Philistines or Babylon, Persia, Greece or Rome. I even think about the early church and how it started. It faced great persecution. The early church started with only 120 people. Just like Israel in the beginning, it was very small. Just the core disciples and their families. But just like with the Israelites, the Lord blessed the church and it quickly grew and multiplied and the gospel spread and the Lord added to their number daily all those who were being saved. And suddenly this little group of believers became thousands and started spreading the message of Jesus all over the world. And that is when... People like Rome and the Jewish authorities started to notice and feel threatened and began to oppress the Christians and even kill the disciples. But the more they tried to, the more the message spread and their number grew. Just like way back in Egypt, so too in the New Testament in the book of Acts, we see that God's people not only survive during persecution, but they thrive within it because the Lord is with them. Well, so now in our story in the book of Exodus, God's people are in this place of oppression and sadness. But it is at that time when a child is born who God would call to deliver them. We're going to read that from Exodus 2, 1 to 10. It says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and they became pregnant, gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what's going to happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. Her attendants were walking along the river bank, and she saw the basket amongst the reeds and she sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and she saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she said. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby, nurse him for me, and I'll pay you. So the woman took the baby, nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So here is when we first hear about Moses. He was born to poor Hebrew slaves, a descendant of Abraham. And just like in the birth of Jesus, when King Herod ordered all the baby boys under two to be killed in Bethlehem, so too here with Moses, the king of Egypt, had a similar decree. But in both cases, God protected his chosen one. But in Moses' case, his mother would have to make a terrible choice. If she tried to keep Moses for herself, she would certainly lose him. She had to let him go in order to save him. She hid him for three months, and when she couldn't hide him anymore, she had to let him go to save her son. She had to trust him to God and God's purposes for him. She placed him in a basket, laid him in the Nile River by the reeds where the rich Egyptian women would come down to bathe every day. And then she prayed, and then she watched from a distance. And wouldn't you know it, Pharaoh's own daughter came down to the river that day and saw the baby lying there, drew him out of the water, had mercy on him. God was at work. She took him in as her own, and the child would grow up in the palace. Now, can you imagine how hard it would have been for Moses' mom to let him go. I have trouble letting my daughter go off to college. I have trouble letting my son drive away on his first day with his license. I mean, imagine that, to leave your baby at the edge of a river. Took enormous faith, but she had to, to save him. She had to let him go. So many times in our life, we have to release control of something. To truly love somebody that they might know the purposes for which God has given them. But imagine how relieved this mother must have been 
to have felt and seen her prayers answered when not just anybody, but the daughter of the king comes and saves your baby. And then God makes a way for you to nurse him a little bit longer, but then you got to let him go again. But what joy must have filled her heart to watch him grow up from a distance with all the comforts of a palace, a better life that she couldn't provide for him as a slave. She probably had a whole lot of mixed emotions even of personal sadness, but also joy for him at his freedom. I picture Moses' mother daily coming and sneaking glimpses of her son as he grows up, praying for him as he grew into a man. Well, at some point, and we don't know when, the Bible doesn't say, but at some point Moses came to know who he was and where he came from and that he's different. And maybe it was that he looked different, skin color, face shape, build, and he just started asking questions. I don't know. Maybe Pharaoh's daughter told him where she found him. I don't know. But somehow Moses comes to know who he is and that he's a Hebrew. And imagine the conflict inside when you learn this. For he was living up in the palace with the privilege while every day watching his own people live down in the bondage of poverty. Well, it eventually got to him. My friend Terrence worked for a company that provided food around the world to people in need. And his job took him to India. And on that trip, what he remembers most was the incredible difference between the haves and the have-nots. And how you're born either a slave in the nothing category or a person with means. And he said what he found so strange and painful was that the mansion was often right next door to the slum. And even though both of the neighbors were Indian, the rich never considered the death and starvation and sufferings of the poor that were right outside their gates. They didn't look upon them even as human. He said it was so weird, they, they did not see that they were the same. They didn't concern themselves with the poor or see in them the same race and nation and humans and people. Moses is in the mansion. But he comes to learn that he is from the slums. But he's living in the wealth and freedom, and they are not. And this begins to bother him terribly until one day he snaps. So we continue on in chapter 2, verse 11, when he snaps. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went back and he saw two Hebrews now fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went down to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. So Moses one day snaps. He goes out and he watches his own people at their hard labor. He feels the tension inside. And so when he sees an Egyptian slave master beating one of the slaves, in that moment, he can't stop himself. He can't ignore it. He can't stay silent any longer. For this is his people. He sees that now. And so he snaps. He identifies as the slave for the first time. He now sees himself in them. The slave is now my brother. And this is not okay. This is an important moment in Moses' life. For one of the things about compassion and love and justice that is so critical is empathy. That you and I would identify with the one being hurt. That we would truly see them in ourself. To love our neighbor as ourself, we need to see them as us. Living in the slums or being mistreated or growing up in hardship. To do unto others 
as you would have them do unto you, you first have to see them as you. And that we would no longer see them as other, but as us, as our brother, our sister, a child of God, a fellow human being made in the image of God, just like us. And that empathy of identifying with others moves us from complacency to compassion. Can we see in the poor our own brother? If so, we'll want to feed them. Can we see in the hungry, the naked, the prisoner, the foreigner, the refugee, the one being bullied, our own child? If so, we'll want to help them. Sometimes I wonder if that is why we don't say more or do more for certain types of people. Because we don't see them as us. Not our people, not our problem. But if it was our kid, or our friend, or our neighbor, we would feel differently. But now think about Jesus. He came to save us. Because we were his. His people, his sheep, his child. He identified with us. He left where he was and came to live where we are. And when Christ is, is living in us as Christians, I believe we'll begin to see people as he does. As one. And I think the Lord also helps us at times, identify with others. And that sometimes we have experiences that we go through that will help us relate, you know, that cause us to better know the divorced or the grieving or the needy or the sick because we've been there. We know how that feels. We're able to see them as our people. Well, in our scripture, Moses, for the first time, comes to see the slave as his brother. And he can't just do nothing. And so he reacts. However, he reacts poorly. He kills the officer. But I think that's kind of normal. For our first reaction to injustice or hurt is often an overreaction. It's an emotional reaction. It's often us yelling or destroying something or snapping. We see this in people today. This was Moses. He knows what he's seeing isn't right, but how he responds isn't right either. He snaps. He kills the Egyptian. But what I find so interesting is that his own people, the Hebrews, they don't cheer when he does it. They don't see him as their hero. Instead, the next day when he sees two of his Hebrew brothers fighting and tries to break that up, they say to him, who made you ruler and judge of us? Are you going to kill us now too? Which is a very interesting line. It shows that they don't trust Moses. They don't see him as one of them. He might be of the same race, but they're not the same. He is in robes and they are in rags. He's living in the security of the palace on the hill and just drops down into the slums now and again to feel better about himself and do what he wants and then runs back into the comforts and the table and the servants. They aren't buying it. They don't see him as one of them, and so they don't trust him. He hasn't lived it. He's still caught between two lives. So what's going to have to happen is that Moses is going to have to move out of the mansion. He's going to have to be displaced himself, be rejected before he can truly identify with the slave and help him. He's going to have to leave the comforts of the hill and become one of them and learn the way of God if he's going to be able to save his people. Moses cannot stay where he is. Now the reasons our scripture gives that Moses runs away is that Pharaoh's looking for him, has heard what he did. But I think this had to happen. God has a bigger plan in this, and we don't always see it until later. But God takes us to where we need to be to prepare us for what he's got coming for us to do. Moses would have to leave where he was to truly become who God would call him to be. One of my new friends is Pastor Bill Thornton, who was pastor of Capital City in Lincoln for many years and then taught at Bible college and seminary for a while. And now he finds himself co-pastor of F Street Church downtown. They do a lot of ministry to those on the streets with addictions and in and out of prison. Well, 
when he and his wife got that call, they knew they were going to have to move. He could not commute into this neighborhood to be effective, to be accepted as their pastor, to be trusted. So he and his wife left their home and moved into the community he now serves. He got to know their families, where they live, and how they live. They bought a house which was very different from the one that they had had before. He talks about how he now hears gunshots at most nights, how there are neighbors of his that are suffering with addictions, and he's often visiting people on the front porch of his house who are homeless. But he had to make his home in the neighborhood to be where they are, to serve. He had to move. He had to be displaced. Again, this is just like our Savior. He did not remain in heaven. He left the glory of heaven. He took on flesh. He made himself nothing. He took the form of a slave, a servant. He was poor. He had no place to lay his head. He made his home among us. Even bore our sin upon a cross. All that we might know him and that he might save us. That is why the writer of Hebrews says, When you pray, you don't pray to a high priest who knows nothing of the life that you live. No, you pray to Christ, the great high priest, who has been tempted in every way as you and yet is without sin. He knows your trials. He knows what it's like to be you. He was displaced. He left heaven to be where you are. Well, God takes Moses out of the palace on the hill and moves him down into the wilderness for 40 years until he is like them. Moses takes care of sheep for 40 years all the time, God is preparing him, changing his heart. And after 40 years, Moses is nearly ready to lead and shepherd God's people. And so the last verse I want to read for us is Exodus 3. When God first appears to Moses, it says this, Now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Herob, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that the bush was on fire but didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why this bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a land that is good and spacious, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I would go before Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. We have no indication that God appears to Moses until this moment in his life. We have no scripture that alludes to Moses even knowing God before this moment. And it is God who makes himself known to him. And how does God appear to Moses? First, in a personal way. He calls Moses by name. He says, Moses. He knows Moses, just like he knows you and me. Even if Moses didn't know him, God knew Moses. He made him. He saved him. He put him in that palace, and now he has put him in the wilderness for 40 years for a reason. So God is revealing himself to Moses as a personal God who knows him. Second, God appears to him in a holy way. He tells Moses to take off your sandals because where you're standing is holy ground. Moses would have to learn that God is to be feared. He is holy. They are not equals. Third, God appears to Moses as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And God says, your father. God connects himself with the Hebrews and Moses to this people, saying, Moses, this is who you are. 
This is where you come from. This is your people and I am your God. Our identity is found in God. And God says, the promises I made to your ancestors, I make to you. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and you. And notice that the original promise to Abraham to bring the descendants into the land of Canaan, God mentions that promise again to Moses here in Mount Sinai. He hasn't forgotten after all these 400 plus years. His promises as true today was when he made it. He will bring this people into the promised land. And then last, God appears to Moses here as a compassionate and merciful God. He says, I have heard the cries of my people. Those are my people, Moses. And they're hurting. They're being mistreated. They belong to me. And I care about them. I have heard their cries and seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And I have come down to save them. God is a compassionate God. Like with Jesus, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will no longer perish, but have everlasting life. God is a merciful God. Here we see him come down to save. So God reveals himself to Moses as a personal God. He knows my name. As a holy God, don't come any closer. As the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as the merciful God, I have heard the cries of my people. But then the last thing, he is a God who calls. For he catches Moses off guard when he says, So I'm sending you, Moses, to go for me to Pharaoh and bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses says, Excuse me? Who am I? And to that, God simply says, I'm going to go with you. He is a God who calls. He always partners with his people to accomplish his purposes. But Moses wonders, well, why me? Who am I to do that? Who am I to stand before Pharaoh? To speak before presidents and kings? Who am I to go for you? I barely know you. Who am I to speak to for two million Israelites who last time I tried to help rejected me and I bombed? Who am I? This feeling, who am I, is the same feeling Peter had when called by Christ. And that Mary had when she was chosen. And that David had. And that Jeremiah had. Who am I? It's the same as that Esther had. And Paul had. In fact, if you do a quick character study of the Bible, you'll find that every time God reveals himself, his purposes and his ways to his servants and calls them to act, they're always surprised that he picks them. Who am I? I don't speak well. I don't even know your name. What am I supposed to tell them? They're never going to listen to me. Send somebody else. But what Moses will learn is that the correct question is not who am I? It is who is he? My God is going to do it. He is the great I am. I think when God created Moses, he already knew what he was going to have him do. I think God saved him out of the Nile where his mother placed him in because he had a plan for him. I think God sent Pharaoh's daughter to draw him out. I think it was God who placed him in the palace for a season to protect him and to teach him. I think God sent Moses out that day to witness the abuse of the slave because he wanted Moses to begin to feel his heart for these people. I don't think God was surprised by Moses' bad reaction, but I think God sent him into the wilderness to make him now ready. And all these years, tend and sheep would prepare him to shepherd his people. Look back at your life. Who you are and what you've been through and what you see is not by accident. God has been with you since day one. He has been calling you for a reason and where you are. He has been trying to get your attention for a while. He's got something for you to do. He has placed his love in your heart, a purpose bigger than you think possible. And you can't do it your way. You can't kill the Egyptian. You got to let go. You got to surrender to God and let him work in you to do more than you could have ever thought or imagined. The question is not who am I? It is who is he? He is the great I am.